This is the Real Estate Shop, where each episode will bring you a top industry expert to share their current programs or projects that are making an impact in our communities today. Be sure to check us out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Welcome to the Real Estate Shop. Today's guest is none other than Ken Lombard, CEO of Bridge Housing Corporation, one of the leading affordable housing groups in the country, celebrating its 40th year in business. Ken, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate this. Great. Glad to have you. Just jumping right in, um, taking a look and going back to your LinkedIn profile, the first experience listed for which I know and recognize you from is president and co-founder of Magic Johnson Enterprises. Can you take us back to the beginning of your work experience and where did you land in the industry out of college? You know, right out of college, I actually went to work for IBM. I didn't go into um, real estate directly. It was kind of a sideline for me. I I was interested and invested in redoing, um, you know, doing rehabs on boarded up houses initially. But so it always had been a passion. But I started at IBM, and then a customer of mine um, who was in the real estate syndication businesses was my first my first step outside of IBM uh, into the real estate business. That's where we. Apartments, industrial, um, hotels, um, and we actually went out and syndicated those uh, with various um, investor groups. Excellent. And then uh, at, at some point, I think you founded um, Magic Johnson Enterprises. Yeah, ninety two. Um, we have been talking a, about it. Um, I noted that Irvin was interested. In, getting into the uh, into the business side of it i had um, a relationship that i had with uh, sony theaters and lowe's theaters at the time and we started that relationship off with uh, magic johnson theater so that eventually branched into um the real estate side which was our first fund with victor mcfarland and then our next fund with with the canyon group and um, Starbucks became a big part of that, that that company portfolio too. Got it. Yeah, I remember uh, being in Prince George's County at the time, and and uh, Magic Johnson opened up right there, not too far from where I was at at the time. So that was my familiarity with it. Uh, I remember a conversation I had with you years back regarding a development site in LA. Uh, at the time, you mentioned the gang shut down the site and demanded jobs. Uh, before talking about the leadership positions you have had, can we discuss what it was like in L.A. and maybe still in L.A. Uh, when developing in our communities? Well, you know, developing in, in the communities, um, in particular, that was Baldwin Hills Project at, at the time was pretty complicated. It was coming after the, the riots and the gangs had decided that they were going to go around to various construction projects. And, and in their mind, uh, do a good thing like forcing diversity and and hiring of minority um, residents in the area. And at that particular time, um, the mall was owned by a gentleman by the name of Alexander Hagen, who had been in the business a long time, long time ally of um, of Tom Bradley, who was mayor for many years out here in in, in L.A. And uh, he had his own way of dealing with things, uh, which was not quite going to fit what we needed at that time. And so he had meetings with the gangs and um, they didn't quite, he thought he could kind of, you know, threaten to call the police and uh, take an approach that frankly didn't go anywhere. And they came down and they shut down the site at that particular time. Um, Fortunately, we were able to convince the, the contractor that we were going to resolve this. Um, so the next morning, we, you know, I got down there at the site with some of my security and um, about 35 gang members showed up and they were committed to keep the site shut down. But we convinced them that if hiring and getting jobs was um, what their agenda was versus a shakedown, um, then we could sit and have a conversation and be inclusive and figure figure out how we could include them in the project. And fortunately, we're able to do that. And we had probably close to two dozen of the gang members that uh, actually ended up working on that site. Excellent. Well, you know, Steve just mentioned that you're 
um, have some dealings with uh, Irving Johnson, and I know you've done some work with uh, Victor McFarlane Capri. How did you, um, through your career journey, how did you position yourself um, into these leadership positions? You know, I've always tried to um, position myself as um, not bringing a whole lot of ego into the equation. So, I mean, everybody has an ego. Everybody has their expectations in terms of what they want to uh, do to be successful. But, uh, you know, I prided myself on being able to work with, you know, high-powered individuals. And you mentioned Victor and, um, and others, but even people like Howard Schultz and um, people like that, that, you know, very high powered uh, executives but you know to me it's just you know I, I, I focus in on doing my job I focus in on uh, providing that adding value where I can and as much as anything in the various positions that I've had of leadership I'm, I'm very protective of whatever the brand may be so um, I'm always one to try to make sure whoever that executive is uh, I understand their pain points I understand their points of sensitivity and making sure that uh, under my wife's suit, there are no surprises. And so communication is always key and finding the right level of um, of communication that that particular executive may, may be comfortable with, um, but providing as much information and as much transparency as possible. And that kind of translates into loyalty and commitment. And that's really what I've tried to lead with. I know in our past guests, we've talked about some of the challenges they've had to, to start their venture. Um, some of the things that have come up has been access to capital and having to do, having to form joint ventures to expand their, their organization. Um, from where you've, you sit and where you, you've come from, what are some of the challenges you've had to face with some of these entities you, that were mentioned? You know, capital has always been an issue um, for for a very long time. I th you know, I think from the beginning of the, my career, um, even now. But um, I think there's no substitute for time and experience. Mm -hmm. And um, what I've always believed is that raising capital is probably seventy to eighty percent relationships, and mm -hmm. twenty to thirty percent everything else. And so I've tried to um, build a reputation of, you know, you do what you say you're going to do, you deliver mm -hmm. uh, and be in a position where um, people can trust you and you can't be ever be afraid to say if it's something that's too much, um, you know, that I, that I need, I need to hold off on that versus trying to gather whatever or do that particular deal and, and then find yourself underperforming. So um, for me, the challenges have been very similar to a lot that you've heard from others. Um, but I've worked hard at trying to understand, making sure how important the quality of the project is. Um, all projects don't work. Making sure that that particular project um, fits the criteria of whoever the investor may be that I'm talking to. And, I, you know, you can't spend a whole lot of your time as, a, as you continue to walk down access and capital trail, trying to convince people that um, this particular project, which may not be in their, meet their criteria, is something they ought to think about. It, it, the homework is figuring out which of these capital sources are interested in the type of project that you have and then trying to marry the, marry the, the two together. That is when the relationship um, kicks in. That's where your credibility kicks in. And look, in my in my twenties and thirties, it's a lot tougher than it is when I'm in my sixties, and where you have a track record and you can, and people can trust you and know that if you bring in a project to to them, it's got you 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 bring some credibility to the table when you're having those discussions. Got it. Seritage Growth Property is a name which I was not familiar. Uh, can you tell us the various role you played in that company, a publicly traded REIT? Yeah. So Seritage was a company that Eddie Lampert started, and it was um, it's still in play now. They um, Eddie had obviously was the owner of Sears, and he took 266 of those properties and uh, formed a publicly traded REIT. There's a gentleman by the name of Ben Shaw who um, I became friends with and still friends to this day, who was appointed CEO. And my initial approach uh, and involvement with, with them was Ben asked me to join their board. So I joined their board 
uh, from day one when we took it public. And then as as time went, um, it, it became clear that Ben was um, interested in having someone serve as COO. So um, he and I had a, a great relationship. We were very loyal and committed to each other. And um, I had gained the respect of the board. And so I stepped off the board at that particular time and took on the COO position until I left. Got it. Apparently, you're president and CEO of Bridge Housing Corporation, another iconic industry leader in the affordable housing business, celebrating 40 years this year. Can you share how you became the leader of this organization and its mission? Yeah, you know, I feel like I've been fortunate in my career, um, throughout my career, to have exceptional opportunities. And most of the time, um, if not all the time, I've never have had to go out and seek those opportunities. And in this particular case, it was, you know, I had left Seritage. I was trying to decide, is it was it time to consider retiring? Um, I set up a few things just to, uh, if that's what the direction I was going to go. And then I got a call from a friend, a longtime friend of mine, uh, Daryl Carter, who used to, um, was one of the co-founders of Capri. Daryl was on the board and he was on the search committee and he began to um, talk to me about the opportunity. And you know, very few times in my career have I I've been able to combine uh, kind of doing good with doing well. And as you, as I, even at the time with Seritage, our office was in Brentwood, and you could see how the whole homeless crisis, lack of affordability, how it was impacting um, just communities across the country, let alone in Brentwood. So no one was uh, was exempt from it, and so he, you know, I got convinced. I got passionate about um, the need for affordable housing. Aside from the fact that it's probably, you know, of all the real estate segments that there are out there right now, it's probably the hottest segment going um, because there's such a huge need, and that you know we're all trying to figure out how we can develop and provide quality affordable housing at, at a level where not only is it scalable, but is it, that it's going to address the needs that are currently out there. So you've got millions of people that fall into this category of um, a need of an affordable option, a quality option to live. And so that piqued my interest. And um, fortunately, the rest of the board agreed with Daryl that I was going to be the the right choice, and you know, I did not have experience in the affordable side of the business. I spent my entire career on the market rate side, but being able to come in and actually uh, understand how, even from a deal structure perspective, what makes the most sense, have the appropriate discipline in setting up the underwriting criteria that you need. These are all the things that I think have been. Um, missing on the affordable side of the business and um, you know, developing that underwriting criteria, being able to go out and raise capital uh, to be able to do it and maybe a little different than what's been done in the past where you have a lot of soft debt um, that still ends up um, for, uh, providing challenges and obstacles to the project, especially when you start cash flowing. These are all the things that I think, uh, fortunately, the bridge housing board um, recognized they needed um, a different way of thinking about this um, and um, I was fortunate enough for them to select me. How big of a footprint does Bridge have in terms of geography and how does that translate to the number of units? So um, we are currently geographically from Seattle to San Diego so we're primarily West Coast based. Bridge has been around. In fact, we're celebrating our 40th year, uh, which was mentioned earlier. Wow. And we currently have about 14,000 units up and down the West Coast uh, and about a little over 125, 126 buildings. So we're continuing you know, on that path. Uh, Value-wise, um, Bridge is structured as a nonprofit, but um, we have a valuation of that portfolio of about $3 billion. Um, our expectation for growth is that we'll take that 14, 15,000 unit number up to over 20 and uh, just continue to look at both 
the ground up side of it, which is a little more challenged in today's environment, also acquisition of mixed income properties that we can uh, put the, the the restrictions on uh, from a from a rent perspective, so they qualify as affordable. That's going to be a, a key part of our strategy going forward. Okay. Well, since they're trying to figure out how to scale their business. Um, you know, from a mom and pop or three or five person shop into something larger, what do you think uh, makes a bridge um, unique and stand out? And um, maybe tell us about how you uh, manage a large geography over time. You know, what, what make, Bridge's platform is extraordinary in that any time you have a company, let alone a nonprofit that's been around for 40 years, it has been able to assemble uh, a portfolio like this, um, it, it's 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 very fortunate for me to be able to come in and run it. Now, what we've got to do now, if we're going to be around for forty years, what what does sustainability look like? What does what growth strategy is going to work? And that's the part that um, we address. We're addressing right now, where we can actually look at all aspects of how transactions are coming together and decide which ones work for us. Um, also looking at um, just going across the enterprise and making the right types of decisions um, regarding efficiency. So um, be, not being afraid to pop the hood up on every department that we have here and figure out um, where we can in, improve the efficiency overall. Um, because you, know, you have an environment that's con con constantly changing. So we have the um, let's say the ground up development side of it, which most groups like us are really dependent on those developers fees uh, to to continue to provide revenue to the organization. Well, it, it, we're in the same position that market rate um, apartments are and, and developers are. You got high interest rates, you got extremely high construction costs, all of which are um, kind of forcing you to take another look at what makes the most sense. And in the case of some affordable housing and some of the markets on the West Coast, you're seeing per door costs that are in upwards of a million dollars a door. And, you know, an unwillingness on our part to kind of continue to go into that structure and not, um, you know, and not be as comfortable with, with the terms around soft debt as they may be um, currently being offered. And that usually translates into uh, a project that you're not going to do. And you got to come up with another um, approach on strategy um, that we, for us right now is acquisition. But acquisition also entails you've got to um, be in a position where you can raise capital and have the appropriate capital to be able to execute on that. But fortunately, you know, we've got um, backing from Morgan Stanley. They We were one of the first uh, groups, to uh, nonprofit groups in particular, to access their geo bonds. So we, we got $100 million in geo bonds. Um, they also provided us with a debt facility um, to the tune of $250 million. And it's that type of approach that um, has enabled us to stay competitive. Um, and, you know, we, we look forward to even our next step, which is actually going out and raising you know our our own fund which uh, an equity fund that we're we're expecting sometime of q1 q2 of next year excellent and i may just mention something a lot of listeners won't know um if they're um junior in this space geo bonds do you mind just expanding on that uh, you know geo bonds are another just another form of bond that you know is issued by the government that um we frankly um uh, right now, it's great. It, we look like geniuses. They were priced uh, in in an interest rate environment that was probably half of where it is right now. So we're in a pretty good position. And it's got the flexibility of being a uh, an instrument that we don't, once we, if we put it into a project and return it, we can reinvest it in another project. So that's the beauty of it. It's got a lot of flexibility on it. So um, and we're continuing to, I mean, the key here is having a group like a Morgan Stanley that believes in what Bridge is, is, uh, is doing, um, even with the transition of a new CEO coming in like myself. Um, they spent the time to get to know me and the 
the strategy that we had going forward, um, how we were going to uh, pull together our just even looking at the various the, the current port the existing portfolio, what we're going to do with that. These are all the things that they they sat and we talked about and they got comfortable with us and which is why we're able to move to the next level uh, with them with the um, fund that they have through any NEF. So we're very pleased with that relationship. Excellent. Besides development and acquisitions, what other services does Bridge provide? So, I mean, everyone who's in the affordable business understands that you, this is not as easy as building an apartment complex and opening up your doors, going through your lease up, but you have tenants that are in need of various services, whether it's um, assisting with finding jobs, whether it's childcare, um, these are all the types of things that, uh, and we're not on the, the extreme side where we're providing, you know, mental health type of services. But if you're in that space, that's another part of what you have to do to have a successful project. So we also, you know, we have items like our scholarship funds that we raised money for. We just recently had a celebration. We raised another million dollars towards that. Um, that's where we provide um, uh, the tenants with, um, scholarships and whatever their vocation may be. So um, we, we, we're very proud of that. Um, we've, we've actually uh, provided about $3.5 million in scholarships to various tenants um, through our through our buildings um, up and down the West Coast. So we're very committed on the, on the services side. We work with the various agencies because they also participate in that and provide funding for that. But it's not, we don't there isn't a project that we do that we're not providing services. Got it. Have you guys gotten to the point? Um, I know when I was with Michaels, they kind of spun off their um, services, um, separate 501c3. Do you guys uh, do services specific to Bridge or have you got it to a point where uh, you third party? I, I just know in the industry. We outsource our services. So you know, I have a department. Um, uh, inside a bridge that oversees that, but the actual providing of the services while we'll select the, the organization that we want to um, administer the services, um, it's all outsourced. It's a great way to do it. I know, you know, you can, really can't even get an award of tax credits without having the supportive services attached to it anymore. So right. um, developers I'm looking at are finding various ways to try to solve that either they hire somebody or you know some of the larger ones are starting their own services yeah we just found it was more efficient that's that's what they do they're in the yep. business of it and so um and in a lot of cases that's a lot easier to get reimbursed from the various agencies or yep. whatever the fees may be so yeah yeah i know you mentioned some of the challenges about the high interest rate the high construction costs and affordability in california has dropped to a 16-year low um, if you look at all these things, what 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 gives you hope uh, that there's there's you know there's still a, a lane here um, for affordable housing? What gives you optimism? You know, I I think if you've been in real estate as long as I have, you recognize that a lot of this is cyclical, mm -hmm. and you know we're going through a tough cycle right now with you know, where you hit, where you do have interest rate and construction costs. But my hope is is that just like every other cycle we've been through, we'll see interest rates. Coming back down to earth, you'll see construction costs getting under control on the construction side. Uh, the, the big hope is that modular uh, construction becomes a real option and you have a company that that essentially um, uh, rears its head above the others. Because right now they all feel pretty much in a startup type of mode and they're not having the effectiveness, but that's another um, area of hope. Um, and as much as anything, um, while there is hope, there is a commitment to recognize that we don't really have an option to not try to tackle this problem and to not continue to try to uh, provide quality housing uh, that's affordable. Because if we don't, then this crisis will become worse. It will become deeper. And um, I I, I, I just don't see this as one of those that the problem is too big to walk away from. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. And I know you mentioned construction costs. And one of the things that, that we find is we all want to be good citizens 
in terms of reducing uh, the carbon emissions, but a lot of these uh, QAPs are now requiring you know, passive house, net zero, all of the higher level of certifications uh, with respect to green, which great great stuff to do, but it, it adds on to the cost. You know, we're already dealing with restricted rents. So right. that's another little twist that, that we're dealing with. Um, one of the great things I just saw about you all is you got an $8 million unrestricted donation from the McKinsey Scott Philanthropic Organization. Uh, when, what impact will that have for you? You know, that it, that is going to be a tremendous help to us. Um, just the mere fact that we got selected. I mean, anyone who understands her process, which, you know, enough accolades cannot be uh, pointed in her direction uh, for the commitment that she has to affordable housing. I mean, look, Bridge is extremely appreciative of being selected but that's what we were we were selected we did not solicit it she has a very quiet process that she goes about um, they do their diligence um, they you they come they ask you a few questions um, but essentially you're in a position where um, you, you either get the call or you don't hmm. and in our case we were fortunate we got the call but you know there's she's She's been a, a very strong contributor towards uh, of trying to help companies like Bridge of solve the affordable crisis. And, you know, my hope is that others like McKinsey will follow um, her lead. And, uh, but in the meantime, I, I got to tell you, it was a huge help to Bridge. That's really excellent. For the benefit of our audience, uh, whether they're emerging developers looking to break into the game or just folks trying to get in on the finance side of the business, what piece of, of advice would, would you share based on your extraordinary career for some folks who are just you know trying to, to start out? You know, there's always been the need for balance because you know, look, as an entrepreneur, you have big dreams and you have projects that you want to take on and you have, um, you know, you, you you, you feel invincible at times because you're going to take on projects that are, you find yourself way over your skis. And, you know, all of a sudden you realize, oh, wait a minute, I got to go find the capital for it. And you don't have all everything lined up. And I, I just think that there's a little, there's a huge need for just trying to find the right balance and approach to getting projects that you know you can execute on. Because it's those first few projects that you do that are going to build your track record. And um, it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not suggesting you pick the size that you're, that makes the most sense to you. you. You don't go around trying to get control of a project and worry about where your capital is going to come from um, after the fact. I mean, that, that's some of the mistakes that I see that are out there right now. And, and it's unfortunate. And, but the barriers of entry have always been the same. They're, they're the same today as they were when Victor and I uh, and others that have been in this business for a long time first got into this business. And but there's there if you if you look at each of us, there's a commitment to execute, and there's a commitment to um, have a lot of discipline around your approach and uh, around your performance. So uh, that would be the advice I give the young entrepreneur: still dream. But uh, make sure you, you're really committed to execution. That's as important um, as, the, as the dream itself. That makes the dream happen or not. So that's what I, that, that would be the advice I'd give. Great. Yeah, it's memorable. Um, if you were to do it all again, would you do anything differently? Oh, gosh, that's, that, that's a good question. I, you know, I've been really fortunate in my career. Um, I think that I've had great opportunities. I've been close and connected at the hip with some very extraordinary entrepreneurs, whether it's Victor or whether it's um, even the relationship I have with Michael Belkin um, and others who have been extremely helpful to me. So um, if anything, uh, it's just, I, it's, it's, I, I'm hard pressed to try to think of something that I would, that I do today that that's different. I'm, you know, fortunately I've got a great family and great wife and kids and, um, and success, you know, has been, been good to me. I have good life and uh, look, you know, 
I'm not Robert Smith. <laughs> you know, I, I, I look up to those guys. And, it, you know, at, at, at the time, it was, you know, the, the early days. Uh, we were all working hard. But, you know, you just try to find your niche and um, be comfortable, be happy, take care of your family. And um, don't worry about being the biggest guy on the block. That's not, that's never been my goal. So Nice. Well, Kate, it's been a real pleasure having you stop by the real estate shop. We look forward to celebrating your victories coming up, and, and no doubt you're going to continue having them with, uh, with Bridge. No, I appreciate you both. Uh, it's been a good conversation, and good luck to you on, on your podcast, and I, I really had a great time talking to you today. Another day at the shop. Content they can't get anywhere else.